My name is Dan Haberling. I'm the key agronomy specialist for Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana with CHS. I just want to start out today by thanking you for watching the video. A lot of times we get questions about where Allegiant Seed came from and what is Allegiant Seed. And as you can see, we launched Allegiant Seeds as a brand in 2016, but it goes back a little bit farther than that. Back in probably 2014, 2015 time frame, CHS did a large survey with all their patrons and it was pretty well responded to. And what we gathered out of that is there was a desire for the patrons to have their own CHS brands. We brought out some prop, crop protection products and those different types of things, but we also came out with a seed line, which is Allegiant Seed. Uh, Allegiant Seed's been around for roughly about six years now, and a lot of that time we've just learned how to be a learned how to be a seed company. Uh, you can see my quote up on the screen that says from Thomas Edison that says, "I have not failed. I've just found ten thousand ways that it won't work." Pretty sure he was talking about the light bulb at that point. Um, what we've come up with and what we've learned is that if we when we have a problem, it's probably best if we go closest to where the product's gonna be used to come up with solutions. And here's what we've learned. So when, when Allegiant came out, we started out with corn, soybeans. Then we added on wheat and sunflowers. Well, we found out that sunflowers was a hard business to be, on, be in, so we really focused on what we can be good at which is corn, soybeans, and wheat. The other thing that we learned is in order to find products that work, we gotta come to the people closest to you to try to find out what type of things that you look for in seed. So that local insight we use to go out and search for products that are gonna work for your area. Another thing that we learn is that a lot of times when we've built out supply plans and decided how much seed that we were going to produce that we would go out and ask for how much you wanted rather than thinking through what was actually going to be utilized from year to year so we when we do a supply forecast we're asking the questions what do you think is going to go in the ground the other thing is is we understand that there's a lot of value in large national brands like the cal girl and they are an important partner of ours. So we're really trying to design our line to be a complementary brand. What does that mean? That means that uh, we find places that maybe that, that major line is a little weak or has a hole, and we come in and we try to fill that hole or fill those weaknesses out so that we can have both brands on the farm and get the best possible result from the whole seed line. Really getting into the beef of the presentation right now. And it's just, the, the title is a little bit tongue in cheek, a few simple tricks to improve corn yields. A lot of this stuff is things that you're probably already doing now. And if we just did them a little bit better, it would really improve our chances to get better yields. Uh, this is really about the blocking and tackling of, of corn production, and it's, it's not meant to be overwhelming. I always like to start with a plan. So failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And the first thing that I like to think about is developing your fertility plan. When you develop a fertility plan, I, look, I like to look at balanced nutrition. I'll go into this more as we get further in the presentation. But the, really the one thing that I want to push now is make sure that you're getting out and getting your soil test done so you can understand that base point fertility of each of your fields. Really, the gas gauge, how full is your tank. The next is crop protection. Again, working with your local agronomist, but I think this is something you need to plan out with someone who understands the, the weed problems that you're having in your area. And then sharpening your ax. Your planting equipment is arguably the most important thing that you do during the year and your equipment should reflect that. 
and then getting the right hybrids placed on the right, right acre. So first, developing a fertility plan. We gotta really start out with our base elements. Our base, base what your crop is gonna use the most. So first off, let's talk about nitrogen. This is gonna be your largest uh, fertility expense. This is going to, um, one thing about nitrogen is it's mobile in the soil. Uh, the nitrogen cycle is a really leaky system, which I'll go into here in a little bit, and maybe ways to prevent that a little bit. But there's many ways to lose nitrogen as we go out. And the other thing that we don't think about, and the other nutrient I'm going to bring up in this is sulfur. Um, really seeing a lot of benefit in doing about a 10 to 1 ratio of nitrogen to sulfur in order to enhance that crop and keep it going well. The other thing when you're, the, the other element that I really want to think about when we're, when we're putting together a nutrient management plan is phosphorus. So you see nitrogen, it takes 1.2 pounds per bushel for a plant to produce, to produce a bushel of corn, excuse me. Phosphorus, it generally takes about four tenths of a pound. Not as much, but it's very important. It's one of the major energy elements. It's involved in the energy, energy production and, and transportation within the plant. The one thing about phosphorus, it's immobile in the soil uh, because it reacts readily with cations in the soil and it becomes bound up and, or it becomes not plant available. Um, the third big one that we often think about and, it's, and when we're out in, in our Western environments, a lot of time we have enough of, is potassium. Potassium generally takes, if you're doing corn, if you're doing corn grain production, generally takes about 0.3 pounds per bushel. This is really a quality nutrient. It's a basic building block of your plant. It, it's in the cell wall, so it's involved with the structure of your plant. Increases root growth, improves drought tolerance, and overall water utilization. And the one thing about this nutrient is the more you try to push your yields, the more you're gonna need this. So when, if you're shooting for a 100 bushel, this one's probably not as important as somebody that's trying to, or if you're trying to get up to that 150, 160 bushel range, then you're probably gonna have to push that. But it's different if you're thinking about long-term silage. If you have acres that are in long-term silage, a lot more potassium gets pulled off the field and you need to think about that a lot more. So, thinking about nitrogen loss. There are really three ways that you can lose nitrogen. First one, and probably the most critical one to no-till, is volatilization. So what, ha you, and you can lose up to 30% of your nitrogen just as it going off in the atmosphere. And what happens is when you throw your urea out there, if we don't get adequate moisture, we don't get that fertilizer incorporated into the ground, if when we get light dews and, and, and precipitation that's less than a quarter inch, uh, that, that doesn't drive that nitrogen down into the soil, it can actually evaporate off with the water and you can see really big losses. The other ways that we can lose it is basically from denitrification and leaching. So leaching occurs when, let me back up, when you put urea out there and it dissolves in the soil, it goes to ammonium, which is fully plant available. But through natural processes and, and in the soil, it slowly gets converted over to nitrate, which is also plant available. Uh, the, the ammonium has a positive charge, which means it sticks to the soil and it's not going to move, move up and down, or not going to move very far into the soil because it's attached to soil. Nitrate has a negative charge. Soil has a negative charge. Hence, if, if we get a big rainfall event, we can really push that leaching down or push, push that nitrogen down through leaching. The other thing, and what we might see a lot of, in this year of 2023 is denitrification. So what happens in denitrification is basically the bacteria that lives in the soil, if you're in a waterlogged situation, will actually take, take the oxygen that's part of the 
nitrate molecule and pull it off because it needs oxygen to breathe just like everybody else. And when that bacteria does that, it makes it into atmospheric N, and you lose N up in the atmosphere, and the only way it's going to come back is that way. Well, to do a little bit of a commercial, we do have some products that can help you out with that. Um, and there are N-Edge line. N-Edge 2 has a very proven technology in it that kind of blocks that that hydrolyzation a little bit and keeps things in ammonium form so that they won't volatilize off. Then for leaching, we have N-Edge soil, which is another proven technology that stops that bacteria from converting ammonium to nitrate. Hence, it will stay in the soil and won't move. And then we have a combo product of both. If you think you got both problems or you're not sure what you're gonna get, we have N-Edge Pro which really takes advantage of both of those technologies. Okay, moving on. We, we talked about nitrogen. Now we're going to talk about phosphorus. We talked about phosphorus, how it binds up and becomes plant unavailable. Well, CHS a few years ago came out with a product of the Levisol line. And it's actually a patented molecule. This Levisol, the, in the lower right-hand corner, you will see that that chemical equation down there. And basically what a chelate does is it, it, it captures those things like other micronutrients that are gonna bind up with your phosphorus and make it unavailable. So really we're keeping both the phosphorus and those micronutrients that could possibly bind it up more available to the plant um, throughout the growing season. Well, we have several different products with this technology. I'm just going to go over a few that could possibly work in this situation. Our newest product is Trivar. Trivar is designed for broadcast fertilizer applications, so when you're out blowing it across the top. Um, it really has three modes of action, hence the Tri. It has three modes of action. One is that key light technology, like that molecule that you're seeing down in the, at the bottom of the screen but also we're bringing in some enzyme technology. The exact enzyme that's in this product is called phosphatase. And what it does is it goes into the plant and helps that plant to mineralize phosphorus out of the organic matter and actually get more of your naturally occurring phosphorus into the plant. And we're also gonna add a little bit of uh, zinc and boron. Not enough zinc and boron to, for all your needs if you're having deficiencies, but it, we do add that. A little bit older product we have is Levisol DFC, and this, this is really designed for dry applications, but this is for your air seeder, stuff that you're going to go into the ground with. You really want to get this product into the ground. For the same, it's going to do the same thing as Trivar as far as keeping things, things available that way. Um, again, it's got the Levisol chelate, and this has some, also has some added zinc to it. Then if we're going into a starter application, we have Levisol ZN. And Levisol ZN is designed just to be a micronutrient for your liquid starter applications. It's a fully chelated zinc with that ortho-ortho Levisol chelate. So, moving on. We're gonna end the commercial. Okay, so let's move on to thinking about your planter and planting. So when we're thinking about planting, what's the main goal of planting? We want a nice, even stand, plants evenly spaced, all relatively the same size. Basically, all of them coming out of the ground at the same time. That's an ideal stand. Sometimes, in almost every field I've walked in, I can find this, where you got plants bunched up like that. Those are doubles. Basically, your row meter picked up two seeds and dropped them down the same thing. And then you've got skips in between, and it's just not as even as, of a stand. So we're having row meter issues on that one. We also may see this. You know, all the plants are there, they're evenly spaced, but we've got some that are, look like they're a little behind, some are that are way ahead, and then some might be missing altogether. This is either a planting depth or seedling vigor type situation. 
And this one I like to show up just for fun. This is actually a situation that I ran into at one point where um, there's just plants were bunched up in clumps and that thing. And we did a little digging and discovered that we had a, a piece of corn residue that was blocking the seed tube and not allowing the seed to come out only in bunches. So thinking about that, you know, how important is it that your plant are maintenance? And this is a checklist that I actually have gotten successful from the successful farming website. Um, there are several out there. You can get ones from John Deere and Case too. But I thought this, for these purposes, this was a, a good talking point. So first of all, level your planter. You think, well, why do I got to level my planter every year? Well, you have tire wear, maybe you got new tires, maybe it's a totally different tractor that you're using. That planter is designed to run level and you need to, you need to adjust and make sure you've leveled, with that, leveled your, your planter with your, with your tractor. Number two, if you think about the way a planter works, we have those parallel linkages. You should check the bushings at the end of those parallel linkages to make sure that they're not loose and moving. If you remember our third example, uh, if, those, if, those, if you're not getting good down pressure and you have loose bushings, that could really affect on how deep or shallow you're, plant, you're planting, can really affect the way your stand looks. Your drive system. Personally, from personal experience, I've seen this. Walk through, depending on the type of dry system you got, if you got a chain and gears, you know, are they rounded off? Are the chains in good shape? Have they been lubricated? Anything that could cause slippage, you know, watch, watch that. Um, moving on. Calibrate your row meters. When I'm thinking about this, look in the book. Look at the seeds sizes and that, of the different types of seeds that you have and make sure that your vac pressures are right and that you're using the right plates and everything like that. Taking a look at your disc openers, do the bearings good? Are they wobbly? Are they, are, are they totally worn down to where you're not getting, get it, getting the seed down to the depth that you want? Um, looking at your seed tubes, does the end of your seed tube look like they're rubbed off? Do you have burrs? That seed has got to fall through that seed tube and you don't want anything between that and when it hits the ground. So look for things that bends and, and, and burrs and those different types of things. Your closing wheel system. May also, the, the perfect scenario is we want to encase that seed or with dirt. We want dirt to touch all sides of it. Does your closing wheel system allow you to, allow you to perform that and have, have a decent um, soil to seed contact. And finally, that closing wheel alignment. Are we digging? Um, make sure it's straight. Make sure it's pushing that seed furrow closed so that, again, gets good soil to seed contact. And then for row cleaners. Residue can be a huge problem. Can lift the planter up, lift your row units up. Are your row cleaners working properly? Get the residue out of the way so those, each one of those row units can function properly. Okay, uh, importance of emergence. So here's a little thing that one of my other KAS friends did down in South Dakota. He actually went out to a plot and he walked up and down one variety and he put a flag in. Um, first of all, he took the white flags and he put those in on the first corn that was out of the ground and put a flag by each and every one of them. Then he came back two days later and he put orange, pink flags in of the plants that came up after that. And then he came back two days after that, two to three days after that, and put in the pink flags for those last ones that came up. So you're thinking, well, why should that be so important? Well, he waited until the end of the season and he actually pulled ears from those plants that he had put in flags besides. So if you look at um, what our white flag ears look like, that's generally no delay coming up. Everything that came up within the first 24 hours looks like a solid, 
solid year there. Pink flags, surprising. We had a little bit of we had a little bit of drawback. Still pretty nice years, probably still pretty acceptable, but we drew that back quite a bit. Now look at what it was like after four days. We really were losing yield on that on those four days. Those ears do not look good at all. So that just goes back to saying how important it is for everything to come up evenly. Again, why is planting depth so important? So if we plant too deep, what happens? You run the risk of that seedling to run out of its seed reserves and not make it out of the ground. So you generally, corn can come up from as, as deep as four inches, but if you have weak germ or something like that, not gonna, it's not gonna be great. Uh, what happens if we go in too shallow? Well, those nodal roots, if you look at the, at the right side of the picture, those roots that are at the top of the soil, those are your nodal roots. That's where your corn plant's gonna get most of its energy from. If you're, say, at an inch or less with that, with that planting depth, those roots are going to grow up, grow out of the ground. They're going to look like brace roots. You're not going to think too much about it, but you're running the risk of not pulling up the moisture and nutrients that you need. Roots are designed to grow below the ground, not above the ground, so you have a potential of things drying out and not work. Also, if we're using a pre-emerge herbicide, we can run into issues with potential damage there. So as you're going out, one way to evaluate a stand is just to do a standard stand count. And what we do most of the time when we're out doing stand counts is the thousandth of an acre method. Basically, we measure out in one row um, a thousandth of an acre, which most people are on 30 inch rows, so that'd be 17 feet, five inches. We count the number of plants, take it times a thousand, that's generally what you're population per acre is. And there you can see that your other, see some of your other row spaces that you could possibly run into. And this really works for any crop. Another method that I don't <coughs> mind using, it's more of just a quick check as I'm walking up and down the field, is basically looking at inner plant spacings. Basically, the space between plants. You can get a quick visual of roughly where you think you're at. So if you're evenly spaced at, say, 22, thousand if you got nine and a half inches between plants within the row that's that's about ideal if you're more than that or less than that then then uh, you you can gauge that from there moving on so working through this early preparing stage and we've covered a lot of stuff but i think the last thing and one of the most important things you can do is getting the right hybrid for your hybrid or product for your farm um, <coughs> i use a this is the criteria that I use, and I've developed this from talking to the local agronomists from around the area of the things that are important if we're going to bring a new product in. And the most, mostly what I'm trying to get by here is you need, to, you need to decide what's important for your farm and look for these elements within the corn products that you're planting, no matter the brand. So number one is yield. Uh, if it doesn't out yield what I'm doing, if it's not consistent in what I'm doing, I'm probably not going to swap out. For these Western environments, we want to look at drought tolerance. And with drought tolerance usually comes ear retention. Uh, most of us can relate to the fall of 2022 about ear, ear retention. Another thing in these no-till environments, we want something that's going to come up in colder soils, so we really look hard at emergence and early vigor. As we work west, and we want to take advantage of every different type of environment where maybe we can back off on the population, ear flex becomes very, very important too. So I'm going to couple in plant height and ear height at the same time, because you got to look at those two things. When we look, when we look into harsher environments where we don't have quite as much water, what happens to a crop generally? Generally what happens to corn and most crops is it gets shorter. And if we've got a shorter plant with really low ear height, you guys are going to be calling a local agronomist complaining because you got to rub your snouts in the ground to get your ears pulled up and get them into the grain hopper. So I like something with a little, little higher, taller plant type and a little higher ear placement 
just for that situation. Um, root rating, root rating is basically that's the receiving door for that, that corn factory that you're putting out there. So if we have a fairly large extensive root system that's going to explore a lot of dirt, find those nutrients and moisture that you need to go to get, to get that plant going through the season. Um, stock rating, one thing that we look really hard at because we've had problems with some products in the past is green snap. And green snap generally happens pre-tassel um, during wind events and that late June, early July standpoint. If we have a really, if we have a product that green snaps very easily or we hear green snaps very easily, we have a tendency to kick it out of the lineup. Um, disease package, a lot of them I don't worry about because we're usually dry enough and we don't have a lot of problems with disease, but one thing that's creeped into North Dakota the last few years is gosses wilt. So for an air, for this area, gosses wilt might be something that you want to consider when you're selecting a product. So when you're selecting products, your local agronomists have, have tools available. They get plots and that type of thing. One thing that we've developed within the Allegiant seed line is our plot data dashboard. And the plot data dashboard allows you to look at plant characteristics, but also look and see how corn performed in different areas to help you make that hybrid selection. So if you're really interested in this, come to your local CHS location, find the agronomist. They have access to this. They can sit down and go through this with you um, fairly easily. Move it on. Okay, we've got our planning done. Um, now it's time to get in the field. So when do we get started? When's a good time to get started? Um, what type of things can I do to kind of enhance my chances at starter or at planting time to get us to get us going and get that plant going? And then obviously I'm going to talk about the reasons for checking for your checking your work. Okay, first of all, soil temperature. Optimum temperature for corn to germinate and grow is 50 degrees. Cold inhibition or cold shock is something that we see really common. And what happens there is within that first 24 to 48 hours after planting, if that kernel takes water in that's less than 40 degrees, you're going to harm the cells in that seed. And you could get things like the picture on the lower right where you actually kill the seed, or the lower left where it damages enough of the kernels that some of the processes don't come out just quite the right way. Um, I usually like to see guys wait until the, the temps are in the high 40s and the temperature forecast is, is going up. Uh, really easy and cheap way of doing this is to go find yourself a thermometer. There's the old dial model models. I really like I really like these digital ones. They're easy to read. Uh, you can usually find them in a, any farm supply store or even, even uh, raid your wife's closet. Just make sure that when you look at that, that it goes down low enough to cover these lower temperatures. So the other thing, and we're, right now we're going to talk about soil moisture. Um, so sins of the planting will sins that planting will haunt you all season long. Um, first of all, looking at the top pictures, we got this open seed furrow, and if you're getting this, and you know that it's wet conditions. If you have an open seed furrow, if you have an open seed furrow, you basically have not done a, this thing any favors. Remember, we're trying to encase that seed in dirt, and what we get here is things like sidewall compaction. So when you see pictures like corn plants, like over on the right, where it looks like mohawk roots and they're all mangled and stuff, those roots cannot penetrate where that, that seed disc smeared the side of the seed and you can, side of the furrow and you can't, you can't get it out. It, it just can't get out and you're really restricting your root growth. Other places that I've seen this is in our heavier clay soils in these western environments when it's a little bit too dry. We may get the seed down there, but we don't, we don't get that closed back up. If you're seeing this quite a bit, take a look at your closing discs. And, 
and um, your packer wheels. You may want to switch to a tooth disc or I've seen some stuff with kind of rolling baskets. Uh, other situations that we can run into early on that's going to inhibit that plant to come out of the ground is crusting. And usually what happens here is we've worked things to a powder and we get a hard pounding rain and it, it, it creates a crust. Um, generally we can get plants to bust through that, but it's, it's kind of difficult. So we're thinking about starter fertilizer. Now I know that we've talked about phosphorus, but really early on, um, we know that phosphorus doesn't move around and we know that early on that plant needs a lot of phosphorus to get going. So if, if at all possible, it's highly recommended that we get a starter down. Um, and generally we see that early on when you're walking through your fields and you're seeing those little seedlings and they have purple leaves on them, that is a phosphorus de deficiency. In fact, phosphorus is so important that the plant will actually respond to it. If, you, if you've got starter out there and you dig up your fertilizer band, band, you'll see where that plant grew its root into that band and it just put a bunch of little fine root hairs around it and it's really trying to mine out that, that phosphorus in that area and, and get access to it. And if you're gonna do phosphorus, remember our micros, can tie up phosphorus, which is basically going to make them both unavailable. And one of the major ones that we have in the area or in agriculture that we need to pay attention to as far as micros is zinc. Zinc, zinc is needed very, very early on in a plant's life cycle. You need to, it needs to up, uptake zinc in order to get its enzymes going and all that stuff. So having adequate quantities of zinc are critical and oftentimes when we pull a tissue test we'll see that zinc is always lacking and that so we're going to jump to another commercial um, CHS lumen is a starter fertilizer a premium starter fertilizer low salt it's got a nice analysis nice plant balance analysis for that early um, that the early needs of the plant it's got some zinc and it's got a little iron in it um, also it has that ortho ortho levisol chelate and but with that we bring in another type of enzyme and that enzyme is hemicellulose that hemicellulose enzyme helps the plant to go as it's encountering organic matter it is it helps that plant to mineralize that organic matter and pull more of those nutrients out. Another product, especially when we're dealing with colder soils, is Unlocked. Unlocked is basically naturally derived plant hormones. Those hormones are cytokinin, gibberellic acid, and auxins. All these go within the plants and basically there's things that already kind of occur in the plant but we're given a little bit of jump st jump start so when we got those cold soils maybe we're worried about seed germ a, a little bit we can go ahead and put this in the tank with our starter at about two ounces per acre and it's gonna help us to get to, to get that plant out of the ground make it just give it a good jump start Okay, inspect what you expect. So as you get out there in the field and you are, you are looking and you're getting started, um, did all your planter maintenance, want to make sure that every, everything, you're sure that everything's right, but still you should go through because you have differing soil conditions and that, those different types of things and check your seeding depth and check your singulation the space between the plants. I would say one, two times per day or per field. Um, you know, I know this new equipment's got a lot of fancy monitors and a lot of fancy sensors on it that tell you a lot of different things. But remember, something mechanical should, can always go wrong. Uh, some of the tools that you need for, for this is, I mean, we got seed depth finders right there 
and see, I don't care what you use, you use a jackknife, pliers, handles, a screwdriver, whatever. But ultimately, what we don't, we want to prevent happening is like on the lower left hand side where, you know, the plant on the right looks like it was planted pretty good, but the plant on the left, that's where we're going to run into issues later on in the season. So, and with that size of that equipment, let's not just check one spot. Let's make sure we're checking behind the planters, we're checking out at the wings, we're doing that type of thing. Okay, in season. Not going to go over it. You know, your local agronomists have a lot better handle on your weeds, insects, and disease situations for the area. But the reason why I urge you to work with your local agronomists is because they're out in the fields every day. They're getting the questions every day. They're going to be more in tune to what's going on with your, with your neighbors and your operation. Just make sure that you work with them to make sure that you're you're going through with your, your weed control or crop protection strategy and that um, if any tweaks or anything needs to made, they're going to have the best solutions for you. Moving on. So nothing good happens to corn in November. If we remember the fall of 2022, I remember it vividly. We had about th two to three days of 60 mile an hour wind. The corn was at about 17%. It got down to 13 and then we started dropping ears. We're talking about how we can, this that year, how we could have improved yields. It's just getting the corn into the bin rather than having it lay on the ground. So, number one, how do we do a better job at this? So, I like to do harvest scheduling. I really preach this to the agronomists in the area. Uh, first of all, go find those problem spot, spots. We know that we're going to have wind in that's coming from the northwest most of the time so we want those north facing slopes slopes those those hilltops where things dry out and those plants are going to degrade pretty quick and basically we want to do some push and shake tests so to do a push test you just walk down the row you stand right next to the plant grab the top of the plant with your hand push it straight out if you touch the other side of the road you're all right if you push and it breaks off above the ear, you're probably all right. If you push and it breaks off below the ear, probably want to get the field off. And when you think about a shake test, think about that wind event. How much is that plant going to get shaken in a, in a heavy wind event? So just sit there and grab it and shake the plant and see if the ear stays on. So if we think about this, about... Ideal moisture is about 15 to 20 percent for harvest. Um, this is a range where it can be dried with natural air. You can throw it in your bins at home, throw the fans on, and it's going to take it off pretty easy. At 20 percent, we're minimizing mechanical damage. And if we think about a seed, a seed is designed to produce another plant. So that plant wants to protect itself. Well, it puts on this, this seed coat around the outside of it that is going to protect it from diseases and stuff until we can get germination to the next year. Well, the same type of things can go on your bin to, to really reduce your grain quality. So at 20%, we're not going to get the splits and cracks and grinding that we normally see in, in the tank sometimes. And it's gonna, that product's going to be a heck of a lot more storable. And I want you to think, last year, you know, there was, there was a lot of corn laying in the ground in some of these fields. And we're getting to be a lot more access to dryers in the area. It just, you know, I know we don't like to pay for dryer gas, but I think we'd have paid for a lot of gas this last year with the amount of corn that was actually laying on the ground. So, another commercial for your local cooperative. Okay. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, Make sure that you reach out to your local agronomist.